Uh, for today's uh, session, we are honored to have here my friend, Professor Benedict Gok. Uh, he's going to speak about, about panentheism in, in, in Indian religion. Yes, one more uh, session on, on Indian religion. So I'm going to say some few words about, about Benedict, and then the, the, the floor will be his. So uh, Benedict Paul Gok is a philosopher of religion in mind. He's an expert in panentheism and non physicalist theories of mind. He's presently professor of philosophy of religion and philosophy of science at Bo University Bochum, Germany. He's also a research fellow at the Ion Research Center for Science and Religion and an associated member of the Faculty of Theology of the University of Oxford. His books include The Theory of the Absolute, published by Macmillan, 2014, and Alle in God, which is German for all in God, uh, published by Friedrich Pustet in 2012. He has edited the volumes After Physicalism, Notre Dame 2012, The Infinity of God, Notre Dame 2018, Penentheism and Panpsychism, Philosophy of Religion Meets Philosophy of Mind, Brill 2020, and the Rotlash Handbook of Idealism and Immaterialism, Rotlash 2021. And um, he's going to speak today about Karl Kraus. And the title of his talk is Indian in Spirit. That's a question. Uh, Karl Krauss's Panentheism in the Vedic Traditions. So uh, Benedict is going to read his text, the idea that he speaks for about uh, 40 to, to 50 minutes. Uh, and then we are going to open for, for discussion. OK, I ask everyone to keep uh, your mics mute. And when Benedict finishes his talk, then everyone will be, will be invited to speak. But now, uh, Benedict, the floor is yours. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much for the kind invitation uh, to uh, speak about Karl Christian Friedrich Krauser uh, in the seminar. And as you already said, well, the title is Indian in Spirit? Question um, mark. As we will see, that probably can be with replaced by an exclamation mark um, because as I'm trying to show um, Krauss's panentheism is severely influenced by Krauss's understanding of uh, the Vedic traditions. So, and I'm a bit of old style, so I'll just present my paper. Uh, you can all hear me fine, I suppose. Is that? Okay, good. Okay. So, and I begin with a few remarks about Karl Christian Friedrich Krause because in current debates he's rather unknown. So the, the German idealist Karl Christian Friedrich Krause, 1781 to 1832, not only was Johann Gottlieb Fichte's most able student, a colleague of Schelling and Hegel, but also a teacher of Arthur Schopenhauer with whom he used to live together in the same house in Dresden from 1815 to 1818. Furthermore, Krause was the originator of the pasigraphical tradition in Jena that led to Gottlob Frege's famous Begriffsschrift. And none other than Nikolai Hartmann referred to Krause as one of the leading figures of German idealism, whose work essentially contributed also to the development of modernity in Spain and Latin America. Krausismo. Krause's influence in Spain and Latin America was reinforced by Junior Saint del Rio, who was sent from Spain to Germany in 1843 for a two year study to find out about the philosophical debates that were going on at that time, so that on his return, he might strengthen Spanish discussions by introducing the discourses conducted in Central Europe. On his journey, Saint del Rio came in contact with Hermann von Leonardi and Heinrich Arendt who were the most prominent figures amongst Krause's students, and was so impressed by Krause's system of philosophy that back in Spain, he published a work entitled Ideal de la Humanidad para la Vida in 1860, which reproduces, in Del Rio's own words, some of the central ideas of Krause's philosophy as expounded in his Das Urbild der Menschheit, like the archetype of humanity. In Spain, the idea de la humanidad para la vida became so popular in part because it promised to fulfill the prevailing cultural and philosophical need for a consistent rationalism, 
thereby becoming the founding document of Spanish Krausismo, one of the dominant cultural forces in Spain up to the time of Franco. However, as Urania, uh, another Krauser scholar, has been able to prove, Son del Rio's Ideal de la Humanidad para la Vida is by no means a Spanish adaptation of Krauser's ideas, but is a literal transla translation of a shorter work by Krauser. Krausism, therefore, is firmly grounded in Krauser's own work. Nevertheless, Krauser is almost forgotten these days. This is surprising and unfortunate, since apart from his important contributions to Spanish modernity and to a liberal panentheistic cosmopolitanism, uh, there recently uh, was a paper published on this uh, by me in Religious Studies, if you're interested in this. Krause was also one of the first European philosophers, unlike Hegel, to appreciate and draw upon Indian philosophical and theological traditions. Moreover, his panentheistic system of philosophy can be seen as a modern version of ancient Indian philosophical thought itself. So in what follows, Krause's appreciation of the Indian traditions is spelled out in more detail before central features of his panentheism are clarified. Geographically, Krause defined India as follows, quote, India comprises the oldest peoples on the Sindh, Gang, and Burumputa rivers, on the entire southern slopes of the high mountains of Asia, over peninsulas on both sides, as far as Ceylon or Ceylon, and the peninsula of Malacca, end of quote. This part of the world, according to Krause, was the historical birthplace of human education and civilization. As Krause says, quote, even if the whole of humanity of the ancient earth did not emanate from India, rather from High Asia, nevertheless, human education, civilization did, end of quote. According to Krause, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Mahabharata, which includes the Bhagavad Gita, and the Ramajana, for the first time in human history, presented numerous metaphysical truths about empirical reality, its ultimate foundation, the goal of life, and the ways to achieve it. In terms of their wisdom, the Vedas, according to Krause, who had a strict Lutheran education, even outrank the Bible and should be considered as, quote, the root and the trunk of the religious life of humanity, end of quote. Sanskrit, therefore, is not only one of the most important languages in the world, but in fact, quote, the mother of our original language of which Persian, Greek, Latin, and German are derived, end of quote. Krause not only recommended learning Sanskrit as an essential language for philosophical reflection, but also felt the need to publish his own system of philosophy in Sanskrit. Krause, in fact, could have done this as he seemed to have mastered Sanskrit to a sufficient degree. I quote, precise knowledge of the Brahmanic Sanskrit language has convinced me that this language, especially as it appears in its strict old form in the Vedams, is an original language formed with a scientific spirit, wissenschaftlicher Geist, end of quote. Against this background, it is no surprise that, according to Krause, the European rediscovery of the Indian traditions in the early 19th century is of ultimate concern for the future development of philosophy, the arts, and the sciences even more so than the changes from the Western Middle Ages to Western modernity. As Krause says, that the reunification of the European peoples with the Indians and, and with Indian science and art would bring about a more important change than the so-called restoration of the sciences after the conquest of Constantinople by the Turks, I already thought in 1807, and realized even more clearly in 1815 and 1814, 1814 and 1815, when I gained even more detailed knowledge of the Indian books. End of quote. Krause was aware that the Vedas, like the holy scriptures of the Christian religion, were written by many authors 
collected over a long period of time and could be classified into four parts. The Yajur Veda, the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, and the Atava Veda. Krause was also aware that different philosophical systems emerged in India, comparable both to the variety of philosophical systems developed in ancient Greece and to the different schools of theological thinking to be found in Christian scholasticism. As Krause says, quote, for thousands of years, a large number of philosophical systems have developed in India itself, which without the Greeks having had knowledge of the Indians or the Indians having had knowledge of the Greeks, form a similar structure to the systems of Greek philosophy." End of quote. Based on the literature on the Indian traditions available to him, Krause distinguished five orthodox and three non-orthodox systems of Indian philosophy. Vedanta, Nyaja, Samkhya, Mimansya, Pantala Yoga, according to Krause, constitute the orthodox traditions based on the Vedas, while Jainas, Baudas, and Kavachas deny the authority of the Vedas. Krause explicitly rejected the Vedanta system, the Vedanta system, because on his understanding of Vedanta, Vedanta is synonymous with Advaita Vedanta and entails the false doctrine of Maya. As Krause says, quote, the main tenet of this system is that the, the one indivisible being as such has no particular qualities and therefore can be said to be nothing, that is nothing finite. When God is at rest, there is no world of physical matter or of living beings. But when God is subject to the drive of infinite longing, the world comes forth as the infinite dream of the divine imagination of Maya. God, as Maya, creates the world in which God reveals himself to himself. Nothing in this world has an independent existence. End of quote. On Krause's view, the biggest mistake of this philosophical system, however, is the very doctrine of Maya. As Krause says, a basic error of primal Indian philosophy is that the world of the senses with all its forms is only a deception, only a fantasy play of Brahma with himself, Maya. End of quote. The reason the doctrine of Maya has to be rejected, according to Krause, consists in the fact that empirical reality ultimately exists and should rather be understood as a divine poem in which humanity plays a significant and substantial role. As Krause says, the doctrine of Maya is a misunderstanding of the idea that the world is an essential poem of God as the original artist. In order to understand this idea, the reality of the human world must be recognized. End of quote. Apart from this critique of Advaita Vedanta, Krause did not have a great exegetical interest in the question which of the Indian systems is philosophically most faithful to the spirit of the Vedas. Instead, he proposed his own interpretation of what he took to be the main insights of the Vedas, which, I quote again from Krause, show themselves as far as our historical knowledge reaches to be the first independent and peculiar whole of the formation of science, Wissenschaft, which in regard to the intuition of the absolute and concerning the organism of all knowledge formed therein, were essentially completed on earth and in this respect cannot be surpassed or extended." End of quote. Krause's interpretation is based on what he identified as the four underlying philosophical axioms shaping the Vedas' principal philosophical outlook on reality, which Krause, as we shall see, wholeheartedly endorsed. <clears throat> First axiom, the primacy of knowledge. Knowledge is a necessary condition for personal salvation and the prevention of evil. As Krause says, the Indians recognize knowledge as the first foundation of all good, but ignorance as the first cause of all evil. They realize 
that without knowledge, the spirit cannot attain to true freedom, to pure selfhood, to the highest good. End of quote. Second axiom, the primacy of God. God, that is the ultimate foundation and ground of empirical reality, is the proper and ultimately the only object of knowledge. As Krause says, what is particularly remarkable, however, is a basic feature of ancient Indian education, that science prevails in its entire life, and specifically pure science, the highest part of philosophical knowledge, which we commonly call metaphysics. According to the Indian system of science, Wissenschaft, science is the knowledge of God. End of quote. Third axiom, the primacy of existential transformation. There is a close connection between knowledge, spirituality, and the transformation of one's own existence. Because to gain knowledge of ultimate reality is a kind of prayer and meditation. Knowledge of ultimate reality and religious devotion do not exclude, but condition and enhance each other. As Krause says, quote, yes, it may be said, if it is correctly understood, that scientific research and scientific observation is a prayer of the spirit, which is in itself contained in the call, essence, God, and Krause could have easily added uh, Ohm here. It is, Krause continues, evident from this that the finite spirit researching science knows itself before God, in God, and always has God's infinite personality before its eyes. It is therefore absolutely certain that scientific research is a godly religious act, called by ordinary names, a worship of God in spirit and in truth. From these, uh, Krause continues, from this emerges the pure, profound, even genuinely scientific, intrinsic, religious sense of the fact that the Indian scientific researchers, philosophers and mathematicians begin all their scientific works with unification, with a prayer. And Krause says, this scientific reason, uh, or the scientific reason for this is correctly stated in the Upnikat, so this is uh, the Persian or the Latin translation of the Persian translation of some of the Upanishads which was available to Krause. So the fourth axiom is, uh, can be called the proper goal of life. The goal of life is to become similar to God. Krause makes this point while explaining the metaphysics of the word Aum. As Krause says, the, the Vedas teach to pronounce the word Aum with thought, with contemplation and mind and declare it to be profound and beautiful according to its individual sounds. This pronouncement is thus recommended by them as a part of becoming similar to God, which contributes to being constantly before God in spirit and mind, and to keeping oneself present before God in God, for as the Vedas teach, he who knows God becomes God, that is, such a one becomes similar to God, although in the finite. End of quote. Based on the hermeneutics of the primacy of knowledge, the primacy of God, the primacy of existential transformation, and the proper goal of life, Frauser provides a panentheistic interpretation of the main teaching of the Vedas. As Krauser says, quote, the Vedas contain the pure intuition, in German, die reine Wesenschauung, of God, Brahma or the Absolute, and the universal recognition that everything that is nature and man, body and mind, is in God, or rather that God in himself is everything that is, that God is present in everything, reigns in everything, guides and governs all life as a whole, that the souls of human beings are capable of becoming one with God, 
if they strive for the knowledge of God, if they grow inward and intimate with God, and imitate God by leading a pure moral life, behaving with others in a just, loving, and peaceful manner, and without falling the impulses of fear and hope and of pleasure and pain. If they become similar to God in knowledge, feeling and willing, in giving peace to all beings and loving even their enemies and persecutors. According to the explicit and repeated declarations of this ancient Indian teaching of the Vedas, the only means of union with God is the intuition of essence or of the absolute through true scientific knowledge and pure and unselfish virtue. But the Vedas recognize ignorance as the first source of all pervasion and evil, that is, the lack of the knowledge of God, which arises from the limitation to sensuality and the resultant distraction and carelessness. End of quote. Because Krause considered the Upanishads, to his knowledge written in the sixth century before uh, Christ, to be a collection of the purely metaphysical teaching of the Vedas, it comes as no surprise that on Krause's understanding, the Upanishads contain a pantheistic metaphysics as well. Again, another a bit longer quotation from Krause. Krause says, summarizing the teaching of the Upanishads, God is the one being, the one that is. He has no opposition and is therefore not to be recognized and named according to any particular quality. He is neither merely the infinite, nor merely the finite, and neither mere doing, nor mere suffering. Apart from him, there is nothing. All that is finite exists through him, and he himself, the unnameable essence, is present in all and rules in all in independent free power, in goodness, in wisdom, and in justice. Humanity's destiny and dignity is to know God, to love God, to become similar to God, to be united with God in this life and beyond. Virtue is God-likeness, must be freely willed, independent of fear and hope, of reward and punishment. These are the basic truths of the Indian system, which are found quite clearly and definitely in the Upanishads. End of quotation. Although Krause himself claimed not to have been influenced by the Indian traditions in any substantial way, the reason Krause held the panentheism of the Vedas and the Upanishads in such high esteem is that, ultimately, his own panentheism, Nolens Volens, is a modern version of ancient Indian thought itself, as we summarized or tried to grasp these in the four axioms mentioned. So let us turn to, to Krause's panentheism. Krause took the Upanishads as an exemplar of philosophy and wished for his own system to be like an Upanishad, as Krause says. If I succeed in bringing even the first six to eight volumes of my scientific edifice into print, according to the plan and outline that is in front of me, then this will be an Upanishad or Mysterium Tigendo. In line with the Vedic traditions, the single goal of Krause's philosophy thus is to enable a liberating existential transformation based on the proper recognition and intuition of ultimate reality. Krause formulated the guiding metaphysical principle of his theory of the absolute, reminiscent of the insights he found in Vedas, in 1813 as follows, another quote. My main principle is that all science is based on the intuition of an infinite substance. This intuition cannot be proven from the principle of sufficient reason, dem Satz des Grundes, but may only be shown present within the human spirit. spirit. Everything that is, is this substance and within the substance. And all scientific knowledge must equivalently be that primordial intuition itself and within it. End of quote. 
In accordance with Indian traditions, Kausa holds that to achieve this intuition of God, to achieve what the Vedas call the intuition of Brahman, the ego needs to free its mind from worldly affairs, reflect on the nature of the divine being, and let itself be illuminated by God in its thinking, willing, and feeling. As Krause says, quotation, in the sacred books of the Indians, too, we find the doctrine of the removal of all superfluous things which scatter the mind and the spirit in useless multiplicity and keep them from the contemplation of and striving toward the most essential truths regarding the nature of the divine being. End of quote. If successful, the thought of this divine being, the thought of uh, Shiva, as Krause also calls God, interestingly enough, <clears throat> is recognized by the ego in its content as an infinite and unconditioned thought. Everything finite that the ego is able to recognize is contained in the thought of this divine being and is recognized as being contained in it. Whatever the object of its thought, when the ego knowingly recognizes it, it recognizes it not only as ontologically grounded in and through God, but also as epistemologically included in the thought of God himself. It follows, therefore, that if the thought of the absolute is the self-disclosure of God, there is no object of reference outside of the absolute. Everything that the ego can know, everything that is, is then the one infinite and unconditional God and the finite constituted in and through God. As Krause himself says, let us now consider this thought, God, in relation to all other definite thoughts. So we first find that, that this thought is infinite and unconditional in its content. That is, that it is a self-same and whole thought. For whatever finite, definite thing may be thought of its object, cannot be thought of outside of God, but as within God, as grounded and determined through God. Therefore, says Krause, all finite specific thoughts, including the thought I, or the ego, are contained in this one God thought, dem einen Gottgedanken. So according to Krause, the thought of God, of God thus specified is indeed self-verifying, self uh, since the thought of the infinite and unconditioned one could not be thought at all if it were not always already the self-revelation of the infinite being in the finite consciousness of the ego. As in the Indian traditions, according to Krause, God, Brahman or Shiva has to be understood as the very cause of our knowledge of ultimate reality. I quote from Krause again, in the Upanishads, God is also expressly recognized as the cause of human knowledge of God. The highest inner state of the spiritual being united with God is called Teriya in the Upanishad and is described in detail. So based on the intuition of God, it follows that the world and therefore everything finite is ultimately grounded ontologically and epistemologically in God, and is thereby essentially similar to God. It also follows that the world being grounded and limited by God must at the same time be a metaphysical part of the absolute and as such a relational intrinsic determination of it. Because, as Krause says, in the intuition of essence of God, this is also found, that God, as the one, is also as such, or in itself, under itself, and through itself, everything. Also the essence of everything finite. Therefore, the statement made, according to this insight, must be that the one, in itself, and through itself, is also the all. Dass das eine in sich und durch sich auch das all sei. And because in the intuition of essence, Krause continues, it is recognized 
recognize that God is also everything in and through itself, the system of knowledge could well be called panentheism. So this is uh, just, by the way, uh, the first time uh, that the word panentheism was introduced in the debate um, in 1828 uh, by, by Krause. So in light of this panentheism, which Krause developed, Krause even provided what seems to be his interpretation of the famous Tatvamasi. So Krause, or we find in Krause's notes uh, the following. This stone, this plant, this animal, this drop, this you am I. And you, O oh animal, are I, I am you. And you, O oh tree, are I, and I am you. We beings all are we, all one I in the primordial I, one being, one thou, one it, one essence. So let us turn um, to the dialectical relation of God and the world in Krause's panentheism. Krause's panentheism is deeply dialectical because it entails the different perspectives on God and God's relation to the world which are best understood in terms of an organic whole and the relation between the whole and its metaphysical parts. The central axiom on which Krause's panentheism rests is that an organic whole has logical and metaphysical priority over its parts and their interrelationships because such a whole is something in which all parts, I quote, are with each other and persist, not just a whole in which parts stand side by side and are combined into a mere aggregate. Rather, in such a whole, the parts are all in, with, and through each other and are all only in, with, and through the whole. End of quote. So in such a whole, regardless of whether it is a living being or not, is what Krause calls an organism. So against this background, Krause introduces three different perspectives on an organic whole and its relation to its part as well as their interrelationships. And in naming these perspectives also relies on prefixes he found in Sanskrit. And I, I also think we can read, I mean, I can only briefly mention this, but um, I think Krause here develops like one of the first metaphysical myriologies, which is really interesting if you relate it to today's debates. Um, uh, on the priority of the whole, um, for instance. So let us look at the different perspectives on the absolute and its relation to the world or on the infinite and its relation to uh, fin uh, finitude. So the first per perspective is the Ohm perspective or Ohm perspective. If all parts of a whole, as well as all relations, of all parts of a whole with other parts of this whole are considered, then that whole is regarded as ohm essential or as an ohm essence, ohm wesen in German. The totality of all parts of a whole, including all relations of all parts of a whole, Krause also calls the inner organism of this whole. The second perspective. Uh, we can adopt is or perspective. When a whole is viewed as the whole that it is, including all of its parts and the relation of all its parts, then it is considered or essential or as an or essence. And finally, there is the ur perspective or the original perspective. When a whole is viewed as the whole it is, without recourse to its parts and their relationships, then it is considered ur-essential or an ur-essence. And on this perspective, the whole has metaphysical and logical priority over its parts. So concerning God and God's relation to the world, Krause argues that depending on which perspective we adopt toward the divine being, the relation between God and the world appears in a different light. So, first perspective. In so far 
as the world is thought of as a relational intrinsic determination of the divine organism, God is thought of as the own essence. In so far as God is thought of as the one whole and self-same being, together with its parts and their relations, God is thought of as the or essence. This thought of or essence is the thought of the one infinite and unconditioned divine being together with its parts and their relations outside of which there is nothing. And finally, if the divine organism is considered to be a whole that has logical and metaphysical priority over its parts, then God is thought of as the Ur-Essence. As Krause says, God is also Ur-Essence, that is, God as a whole being is prior to and over and above all that God is in, under, and through itself. End of quote. So Ur-Essence and Ur-Essence I know if you hear this for the first time, this must be a bit confusing, all these or essence and or essence, but uh, uh, one gets used to it. <laughs> so or essence and or essence must not be confused. If or essence is called God, says Krause, then God seen as or essence cannot simply and without any additions be referred to by the name of God as well. But it must then be said, God as Ur essence or simply Ur essence. So deploying the distinction between Ur essence and Ur essence as different perspectives on the divine organism, God's dialectical relationship to the world can be described as follows. As Krause says, quote, through this, therefore, is proven the fundamentally important distinction between the following two propositions. The world is outside of God, and the world is outside of God as the Ur essence. The first sentence is fundamentally false because, apart from God or Ur essence, nothing is conceivable, in that the infinity and unconditionality of God would be denied by the slightest external appearance. But the other sentence, that the world is outside of and, un, of and under God, in so far as God is the original essence, states a fundamental truth. Based on the distinction between or essence and ur essence, Krause is therefore able to infer that, quote, the old dispute about the relation of God to the world, whether God is extra-worldly and the world is an extra-divine being or not, is satisfactorily solved for by distinguishing essence from itself as ur essence it is seen that god or essence as one is a self same whole essence neither outside nor above nor on nor in the world but certainly in himself under himself and through himself god is also the world end of quote Maybe could I share my screen after all for uh, just a second? Yes, yes. Hold on a bit. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. Okay, I think you'll be able to share it now. And it, it tells me that I could let somebody enter into the waiting room. No, 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 don't worry about that. Just click on the share the share button, share screen button, and, and, and share it. Because I made you co-host, so I'll show this. Yeah, I... How do I share my screen? I think there is a button called share screen. Can you see it? No. There is, there is chat, reactions. Ah, yeah, 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 no, yeah, 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 sorry. Good. Uh... Uh, just a second. Mm -hmm. 
No, I think it doesn't work because my computer somehow has a, has a problem. Um, but anyhow, I think I can. Uh, there's a way around this. Because, because Krause also developed uh, a diagram and a scheme in which uh, he tried to uh, visualize the different relations between God and uh, uh, yeah, God and the world. I mean, you, you will be familiar with this because, well, from all the, the Venn diagrams. So if you look at this now, you can see that the, the largest circle, which contains all the other circles, that is what Krause would call uh, Ohm essence or Ohm wesen. So that is God. And so far as we consider God as uh, the one infinite and unconditioned being outside of which is nothing. And if we now look at the smaller circle, which has a U in it, uh, that is God considered uh, as a whole in so far as the whole has logical priority and metaphysical priority over its parts, which here are symbolized by the two lower circles, which for Krause are uh, spirit and nature. So in a way, this uh, scheme, well, sums up Krause's uh, panentheism very easily because we see that outside of Ohm essence or outside of uh, God considered as the, the one uh, infinite and unconditioned principle, there's nothing. We have God separated from nature and spirit, but still uniting a nature and spirit, which is uh, basically what in today's debate would uh, be referred to as, as metaphysical grounding. So uh, on uh, on Krause's panentheism, um, the world is grounded in God metaphysically also, in quite the same way in which uh, the, the, the parts are grounded in, in the whole. So Krause also would, would probably argue for um, the priority of, of the whole, obviously. Um, so let us just, uh, how, how am I with time? Do I still have? Well, we spoke for about 45 minutes. Okay, we, we, we can stop here then. Okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Okay, thank you very much, Benedict. Wow, that, that, that was a very, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions, but uh, if someone wanna, Ask before me, please just raise your virtual hand. Okay, so I, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, the first question then. Um, okay, uh, uh, that, that might be a kind of detail, but maybe not. So uh, you you at some at some point we spoke about a uh, Krauss uh, belief that we are uh, in some sense. No, no, not that you are similar to God, but that we must become similar to God, yeah. right? Yeah. So uh, uh, then I have two, two questions. The, the first one, this becoming, he thinks that uh, we are somehow uh, going to a kind of original state, or this becoming uh, somehow involves things external to us or external to our essence, so, so to speak. I ask this because uh, uh, as far as I as I know, many Indian traditions they they speak that, and this has to do also with with the, the whole Vedantic debate about the relationship between God or Brahma and individual uh, uh, souls or individual living beings, because because uh, Vedanta defends that we are somehow one with God, and and so, so the, the the point is to explain what what this oneness means. Yeah. So, so uh, I, I'd like to know, to know from you uh, uh, how Krauss thinks about this relation, because I spoke about the relation between God and, and, and the world, right? But uh, I'd like to hear from you what he thinks about the relationship between God and ourselves. We are, we are, and, and of course, by doing that, perhaps you can also answer my question, what this becoming means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um... So on Krauss's panentheism, ultimately, only God exists. So it's it's a kind of uh, existence monism. But for Krause, given his met metaphysical Mary Mariology, that entails that all the parts, so the the metaphysical parts, not not spatial parts, 
of the divine being exist as well. So uh, it's not like um, the empirical world is an illusion. The empirical world and our lives are part of um, the, the one divine life. So history or the infinity of, of the universe, which Krause presupposed, is basically the one life of God in which God tries to realize his essence, his eternal essence in time. And Krause would say that we ourselves, um, concerning our constitution, stand somewhere in the center of the absolute, basically because we are beings which participate uh, both in nature, or in the realm of nature, and in the realm of the spirit. And when Krause says that the goal for us is to become similar to God, um, um, yet one point also says, uh, uh, I mean, this is today probably more often associated with, uh, with Nietzsche, uh, that we have to, to become what we are, um, because we are already, given our essence, um, divine beings and constitutive of the one divine essence. But we have to realize it freely in time. So the way to become similar to God for Krause is actually to realize or to see God, to have a vision of God, um, and to and, and and this vision of God basically entails a, a life changing um, existential uh, transformation because. Once you realize that there is only God and that, that you yourself are part of the, uh, the divine life. And once you realize that uh, God is also the, the supreme good and, and the ultimate good, you really want to transform your will and your actions in such a way that you act according uh, to the one law of morality, which, which Krause summarizes as just do the good because it is good and don't think about reward or punishment. Just try to do the good, build a beautiful world. Uh, I mean, Krause also talks, about, talks a lot about the arts. Um, try to um, respect nature, try to respect every finite being and try to help every finite being to realize its own essence. And um, the essence of human beings is well to, to realize God and to trans and to change reality in such a way that it becomes well the 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 civitas dei, so the, the state of God on earth. And and for Krause, uh, interestingly enough, this leads to um to to a philosophy of law which which is very very close to uh, to the capability approach uh, which today is developed by uh, by Martin Nussbaum and and uh, Amartya Sen, because Krause's idea, for instance, is. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit off topic now, but, but Krause's idea, for instance, is uh, that concerning animal rights, I mean, he would say, of course, they have animal, uh, of course, they have rights, because like us, they are part of, of, of the, the divine being, and therefore there is a moral duty for us to treat them with respect, for instance, and to enable them to live a life according to their, to their essence, yeah. Does that answer your, I, I don't hear you. I'm sorry, <laughs> my mic was mute. So uh, uh, if understood well, then according to Krauss, uh, we, from ontological point of view, we are already similar to God. So this becoming similar to God well, means uh, basically that we will act according to this essence of ours. Am I right? Well, or we act and we act because of an insight into the nature of the divine being we have. I mean, in a way, Krause would say that you can understand empirical reality as a self-revelation of God. I mean, Krause would argue that once you once you're there, uh, you you realize that uh, God is everywhere. So be, before that, before you reflect on on the nature of the divine being, um, you don't see that God is everywhere and that God is in every being. But once you're there. You can see it um, that all is God, but but your essence, from a metaphysical point of view, is already divine because it is part of the divine being. But you have to realize your essence freely, and understanding and seeing the nature of God as as 
the pure good or the highest good is what is the motivation is the only motivation for the world do the good because it is good yeah. okay good 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 thank you now uh Rabin. yeah please you can ask your question uh yeah thank you very much uh for the nice talk it's been a long time i haven't been in such a you know interesting talks about indian philosophy um uh, actually um uh i had you know, uh, genuinely, I have a kind of problem with this uh, uh, kind of, let's say, westernizing uh, interpretation for uh, Indian philosophy. Um, I've been in, in studying in India for five years in, uh, you know, uh, Indian philosophy, and, you know, but uh, I always had, had even it's a debate uh, in India that how uh, how, how we approach uh, to interpret, uh, you know, such a kind of uh, um, uh, concept as an Atman or God or at Brahman. Uh, either we had a kind of uh, a kind of uh, Western approach to interpret this kind of uh, concepts, or uh, we have to uh, engage into the discussion uh, through that, you know, let's say. Uh, uh, Indian kind of mentality to, to discuss this kind of uh, situation, but uh, overall I was uh, very uh, you know uh, you know happy with this uh, discussion. Uh, but one question, uh, you know, uh, there is a I'm, I'm sure that you uh, are aware of the uh, very highlighted you know uh, statement uh, in Briadranka uh, uh, Upanishad that he describes. Uh, Atman as uh, Brahman. Uh, if we uh, Atman is a, we know that it's a self or individual self, and Brahman is a, let's say God or the supernatural power. So according to this uh, interpretation, that yeah, it is true that we pantheism. Uh, however, you know there is so many discussions. Uh, about either it's a pantheism or uh, what's called um, monism uh, anyway. But I think uh, this interpretation is uh, uh, very fit for, 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 for the, the, this relation between the Atman uh, and Brahman. Uh, but um, what is, um, uh, I'm concerned, you know, about this, you know, the, you know the, this issue. This issue cannot be uh, put in a, in, a, in, a, in a logical formula, I, I, I think. So for example, in that, that diagram, uh, um, uh, Krauser, uh, you know, uh, uh, draw a, 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 a big circle that it's a God, but the God is, 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 no, is, is nowhere. Actually, and the ways that we can reach this God is a kind of spiritual exercise, like, um, for example, Hadot says, it's kind of uh, spiritual exercise that you can uh, be Brahman, uh, but uh, there is no, uh, finally, there is no any guarantee. That's why there is always, you know, there is another concept in uh, Indian philosophy that is, say, moksha or uh, uh, let's say enlightenment. Uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Rabbi, Rabbi, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Could you, could you perhaps phrase your question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, um, my question is basically uh, is that how can we, uh, is it possible uh, to uh, frame this, you know, interpretation in a logical form? Mm -hmm. um, you, you... Do you mean Krause's interpretation, or do you mean the the relation between the self and God? Yeah, the 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 the, the, the Atman and God and the world and God. Mm -hmm. um, well, Krause would would argue that um, mm -hmm. there is a difference between Atman and Brahman, um, but they are of the same essence, nevertheless. So he would say that um, the true self, um, which I am, is finite in certain respects, but ultimate reality is not finite. 
But nevertheless, because it is, so to speak, all of reality is in Brahman, Krause also says that basically everything of or every thought we have, every feeling we have ultimately is a thought and a feeling of Brahman, of ultimate reality. Because um, there is unity in ultimate reality. And he would say, although, I mean, basically, probably, I mean, if, if you look at, at this diagram, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm unable to share my screen. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we would be, Atman would be there, basically. So that's the true self in the center of reality. Um, participating or, or, or in participating in all the divine uh, diagrams, but it is not the Atman is not itself the the Brahman, although they share the same essence. I mean, Brahman is basically the the ultimate entity, so to speak, the ultimate which determines the being of every other entity. Yeah, but but we need also. I mean, Krause says that. Um, and, and maybe that is that, that is related to to, uh, to 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 bhakti yoga or, 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 or and, and to to forms of uh, of um, buddhi yoga, so of the different forms of um, trying to to realize God, as they, for instance, are, are described in, in in the Bhagavad Gita. So Krause would also say, well, there are different ways to obtain knowledge of the divine. He would say, well, there are some. Uh, who focus more on thinking, so which is then more uh, a philosophical endeavor. Um, but Krause was very keen to argue all the time that feeling and uh, and thinking and wanting belong together and are equal of e and are of equal value. So, and and Krause also said that the recognition of God or of Brahman is is a spiritual. Uh, state of the human mind because it is not the conclusion of an argument logically because you cannot prove the existence of of ultimate reality um if you understand it as also ultimate reality in an epistemological and ontological point of view because everything for instance the principle of, of sufficient reason which you would have to use in order to prove the existence of god already presupposes uh, the existence of god on krause's view because the principle of, of sufficient reason is itself something finite, which is, which only is applicable to empirical reality because of the, the structure of the absolute. So, um, yeah, is is yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and of course, I mean, just to come back to to what you said at the beginning, yeah. I mean, Krause's knowledge was based on 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 the papers and and books accessible to to him at the time, and. Um, Although in, in the Western debates, I mean, one often tried to, to understand the inner traditions basically in terms of, of the Christian Trinity or the, like the Trimurti and, 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 and stuff. Krause didn't do that as far as I know. So because he himself had, a, had, had certain problems with the anthropomorphic picture of Christian theism. So he, he rejected that uh, as adequate as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So, Rude, uh, he's asking Benedict if you can share your paper. It would be uh, yeah, I can. I, I can send it to you later. Okay, 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 good. Okay, okay, right, right. Or, or otherwise, if you can paste the link in the chat, it would be good if you can, but you can do that later. Yeah. Now, Harvey, please, you can, you can ask your question. Hello. Um, so I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you for that. I found it very insightful. Um, I'm not too familiar with uh, Krauser uh, nor uh, ancient Indian interpretations of God, but a problem that I always find when trying to justify pantheism to my friends and colleagues uh, is to do with the problem of evil. Uh, if God is the unity, uh, I always find myself having to say that um, either the, the unity, the pantheist God is amoral, or, or uh, because I and you and all of uh, all of the other things are, and all of the worst things that you can think of are all of the same things. Um, right, like I find that a problem and I wonder what kind of discussion is is kind of happening in the literature that you're engaging in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, 
I mean, I mean Krause's answer to, to the problem of evil is um, is based on the idea that there is a conceptual link between uh, finite, finite entities and finitude and the existence of evil. So um, on Krause's panentheism, the world is uh, the, the sum of all finite entities. I mean, nature is finite in some respects, the spirit is finite in some respects, humanity is finite in, in some respects. Uh, we, we're living on a planet with, with finite resources. And Krause says, well, if there are finite entities uh, living together on a planet with, with finite resources, and if each of them tries to realize its own essence, it is almost inevitable that um, there will be evil, at least in the sense um, that, uh, at least in the sense of, of natural evil, for instance. Um, concerning moral evil, um, well, Krause actually would, or, or, would, would favor the, the, the scholastic or the, the Thomistic solution in a way. I mean, Krause also says that nobody really chooses to do evil, but people are mistaken in their judgment on, on uh, what is evil and, and, and what is good. Um, so that's the one front on which Krause uh, would respond to the problem of evil. Um, the, the other problem is, or the, the other possible solution, but I don't know how much that is my solution or Krause's, I don't know, is um, to to undermine the the uh, or to 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 reject the premises of the problem of evil, at least in its classical formulation, where it says that where where it, where it presupposes or the, the classical version of the problem of evil presupposes that there is an omni god and no world, and that the uh, omni god creates the world out of nothing. And why didn't he? He, he make a better job with the world he created. And on Krause's panentheism, the world is uh, exists of necessity and uh, is everlasting in the sense uh, that there never was a first point of time of existence. So there wasn't a Big Bang, um, but there always exists finite entities in an infinity of, uh, well, yeah, well, it, in the infinity of, of time. So that therefore we cannot complain, why didn't you make a better world? This is just the divine being as it realizes all the possibilities of its essence in time. And sometimes that includes evil. Yeah, and I don't know how, how close Krause here is to Schelling, of whom I'm also not so sure whether he at sometimes can be read as the, if he would as if you bit the bullet and would just say, well, yeah, there is evil in God in a certain sense. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Okay, cool. Hey, th thank you very much. So, so Jens has a question, but before I, I, I give the floor to him, uh, there are two questions here in the chat. The, f the first one is very, very quick. Natalia asks the following, is this um, if, 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 if this is what the crowds who influenced Schopenhauer. So this is the first question. And there is a longer one by Anderson. He asks um, as follows, could we conceive in Krauss' thinking the one God as existence with capital letter as everything else, such as, such as us in the world exists with a lower E, uh, I'm not clear if I understood that, but um, I, I'm going to send to to you in the chat the the, 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 the Anderson's question. But perhaps you can answer the first about Schopenhauer and Krauss. Um, yeah, Krauss. I, I I think one can argue that there was a, a strong influence uh, on Schopenhauer. Uh, 
bei Krause um, and bei Krause's work. So they used to live together. And if you look at, I mean, I, I published a paper on, on this question. Um, if, if, if you look for Krause Schopenhauer and, and my name, um, then probably you will find it. But but in fact, there is a lot in the world as will and uh, representation, which also is in Krause. And we, we know that Schopenhauer uh, visited Krause's lectures, uh, which he delivered to his kids. And um, um, towards the, the end of, of the world as, as will and representation, uh, the second part, uh, Schopenhauer is more open to the possibility that ultimate reality may have properties other than just the will, der Wille, or maybe something else than just uh, der Wille. And that is also entailed in, uh, in Krause. Al although one also has to say that uh, uh, it, it was another scholar at the beginning of the 20th century who said that, that uh, Krause is a very optimistic guy and, um, and Schopenhauer uh, not so in in a way. So there, there, there is a there's a difference in the general outlook on on life. And uh, another scholar, uh, I forgot the name, once said that well, I mean that Schopenhauer tends more to well to, to Buddhism and uh, Krause more to 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 the Indian uh, traditions. So that maybe I mean this is a question for further research. Maybe it would be quite interesting to see how the debate between Buddhism and, uh, and whatever, and, and, and some, some uh, Vedic tradition is mapped or can be found between Kaus and Schopenhauer. But, but that's, I think that's an open question, but it's an interesting idea. The, the other question is- um, Is in the uh, chat, you, you can, you can yeah. read it. Yeah. Yes. And perhaps you can explain the question, I mean. So, me yeah yeah because i read it i, yeah. I... okay so 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 the, the question is whether we um well basically the question is how much scholastic uh metaphysics there is in krause so can we on krause's uh account consider god to be pure being or being with a capital b or existence with a capital e and all finite entities as somehow participating in that or having their own existence from the being existence with a capital um, in a way yes in, i would say it's more complicated in Krause, but um, he says that the absolute is pure actuality um, and that every finite entity only exists because well as, as a metaphysical part of that which is pure actuality it participates in the pure actuality of uh, of god yeah okay okay thanks so lemoski the floor is yours yeah thanks a lot and thanks for the talk um, I have a short question on the influence of uh, Indian religion on the other types of work across it. Did. So as far as I remember, I was, I was very surprised as I read that he published uh, an amount of books of uh, more than 100 in very different uh, sections like music theory and jurisprudence and so on. Um, and you show also some comparison, by example, by the diagram, and that there are some influences on Indian religion and logic. So, are there other influences uh, in which Indian religion or philosophy plays a role in, for example, music theory or so? Do you have any idea on that? How do we combine all these these areas? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, good question. I mean, how the also a theory of aesthetics and music. And in that he also mentions uh, Indian music as uh, uh, the beginning of um, rhythmic uh, music. And he also correlates that then to uh, mathematics and, and logic. Um, uh, yeah, so he, he does that. Um, in his writings on logic, so Krause has a, 
as, as two books or two, two main books on, on logic, uh, one on synthetic logic and one on analytic logic, the uh, historical logic. I don't, I don't, I don't know whether there's, whether there is a big Indian influence in there. I wouldn't exclude it. Actually, I, I do not know. I mean, I do not know. I, the, the, the interest, I mean, Krause has, has, a, has a lot of mathematical and logical stuff st and, and also still unedited in the library in Dresden. So there is, it's 20 meters of, uh, of books and, 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 and his notebooks and it's completely unedited because nobody so far decided to <laughs> well to to spend his life doing this um but 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 there may still be uh, a lot yeah i mean just concerning the 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 venn diagrams i think it's uh, probably you, you know the paper by by uwe meixner on on on, on the diagrams so, uh, uwe meixner a german philosopher well argues that well maybe the Venn diagrams should be called Krause diagrams because Krause had, uh, well, uh, the first very systematic combinatorics and and syllogistics, uh, even yeah earlier than than Venn. So, so he he was uh, he, he Krause left his marks yeah, <laughs> but but, but I, to come back to your question, I, I think well, I, I don't know right now. He, he always mentions the Indian uh, traditions, but whether there's a big uh, influence in his theory of music also i i do not know right now but but it's a good question <laughs> okay thanks okay good so so perhaps i can ask a second question of mine um so uh benedict you mentioned at some point that uh our knowledge is also god's knowledge you we spoke in terms of of thoughts right yeah. Of course, think thoughts. Let's 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 yeah. speak in terms of beliefs yeah. as a mental state. Of course. So I was wondering, uh, how about other kinds of mental states, mm -hmm. should, such as experiential or phenomenological uh, mental states, such as pain? So the question is, does God feel my pain? Uh, so, some people, I mean, some some versions of cosmopsychism, they they entail that, and some people see that as a problem, that God feels my pain, God feels my anxiety, and so some people think that God is not supposed to have this kind, uh, and to experience this kind of, of mental state. So, what Krauss would say about that? Um, he would say he, he would answer with a qualified uh, yes. Uh, he, he would say because everything that is everything that exists is in god and is part of of, of the divine being and of the 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 uh, one divine life uh, therefore it follows that all your mental states so all your stream of consciousness is part of well the infinite stream of consciousness if you if you wish uh, of of god but he would also say um that is only true if we look at God as the Om essence. Uh, if we look at God at, as uh, the Ur essence, so as the whole which grounds everything, uh, I think Krause would exclude pain uh, on from the divine being and so far as we consider it like the ultimate ground of the world, which forces us to make it a distinction between God and the world which then is taken back basically if we look at um, God as the infinite and unconditioned being but yes yeah I mean all the considerations uh, I think was uh, Linda Zagzebski and, and, and the concept of omni-subjectivity that is uh, also something which resonates with um, Krause and, and, and Krause also said um, and I think it was a bit earlier than Hegel that that in our self consciousness and that in our self feeling and in our self willing, uh, actually um, God becomes self conscious of Himself as this human being. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you so much. So our, our time is up. So thank you very much, Benedict, for the my for pleasure. <laughs> Thanks everyone for, for being Thank here. You. So um, just a short announcement. Oh, okay, just a short announcement then, Jens, you, you, I don't know if you 
if you raise your gain, it, oh no, no, okay, he doesn't, he doesn't want to talk. Okay, um, uh, so our next webinar will be in April 13, will be delivered by Itela Dottaviano, and she's gonna speak about the logical problem of evil from a for a consistent perspective. Uh, she's a logician, so I, I hope we will be able to, to be here. Have a nice evening, uh, uh, whatever works for you. Thank you very much again. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye.